Dobrý den, vážení diváci. Jmenuji se Dalívor Gruza a narodil jsem se v roce 1973 v Hustopečích u Brna. Absolvoval jsem Matematické gymnázium v Brně a Právnickou fakultu Univerzity Karlovy v Praze, kde jsem rovněž absolvoval postgraduální doktorantské studium. V současnosti vedu advokátní praxi v Hustopečích u Brna. I ve volných chvílích se věnuji právu a zajímám se o filozofii. Od roku 2004 jsem ovolakto vegetariánem, výjímám mého jedení zvířat, která nebyla umyslně zabita žádným člověkem. Blízké je mi frutariánství. Mám za přítele a svěřeného psa, který se jmenuje Gud, čili dobrý, kterého se snažím krmit podle zásady působení co možná nejméně smrti a bolesti. Dále mám Útulek pro brojlery, ve kterém chovám v současnosti cirka 42 brojlerů. Blížší informace o těchto chovech se můžete dozvědět v mé knize Filozofie rovnováhy. Ve svém díle navazují mimo jiné na dílo prvního československého prezidenta Tomáše Garika Masajka, proto mě potěšila možnost koupě domu, ve kterém Masaryk v letech 1861 až 1863 jako student bydlel. V roce 2009 jsem vydal knihu Filozofie rovnováhy s jejími základními myšlenkami vás chci seznámit v tomto filmu. The Philosophy of Balance modifies Darwin's theory of nature's evolution as understood by today's natural sciences. In addition, it deals with the role of mercy from the point of view of nature's evolution. We will begin by introducing the attitude of today's natural sciences towards nature's evolution in the words of the evolutionary biologist and Catholic priest, Marek Orko Vacha, head of the Institute of Medical Ethics at the third medical faculty of Charles University. According to Marek Orko Vacha, Darwin's theory, which actually represents the most successful theory of nature's evolution in the history of science, can be described in the following manner. There is substantial difference between nature's evolution and Darwinism, Vacha claims, adding that Darwinism is one of many attempts to interpret nature's evolution. Evolution is an obvious fact a phenomenon that we observe in nature. Different interpretations are offered, for instance, by the theory of ontogenesis, neutral theory of evolution, or Lamarckism. The dispute about the existence of evolution, for example, that species in nature change over the course of time, is regarded by science as having been solved, and the solution is considered definite. Marek Vaka goes on to say, that according to Darwin, all siblings differ from each other. Few of the siblings survive in nature, as the parent couple's reproduction capacity is greater than the offspring's ability to survive. For example, an oak tree produces hundreds of acorns. The burbot fish produces a million of eggs per kilogram of live weight, and titmice bear between eight and 10 young per year. We don't feel that the number of oaks, fish, or titmice in nature is rising. This is because nature's resources are limited. Reproduction success is not entirely accidental, but depends on differences among siblings. For instance, a rabbit possessing sharper eyesight will glimpse a predator earlier. A rabbit with strong legs will escape a fox or hide from a hawk in time. Thicker fur will enable survival during winter. A better immune system will provide more efficient resistance to disease. Thus, the fittest ones will survive. Darwin was helped by artificial selection. By example, artificial breeding of, for instance, dogs, plants, etc. by humankind over its history, with humans apparently doing the same as in nature. Thus, the fittest ones will survive. Darwin was helped by artificial selection. Artificial breeding of, for instance, dogs, plants, etc., by humankind over its history, with humans apparently doing the same as nature. Vacha also says 
that a breeder picks those pups from a litter that he likes best, letting them breed among each other again and again until we have a Dachshund breed from the original wolf. On the other hand, or for example, a St. Bernard on the other. Darwin realized that there is no wise breeder in nature. There is only nature itself. He realized that in nature, there is cold, there are predators, there are bacteria causing diseases, etc. Nature appears to function as a breeder in its own right, capable of breeding new species of organisms, including man. These deliberations form the basis of Darwin's theory. Marek Orkovaja finally comes to the conclusion that while there is nothing in Darwin's theory that would prove the existence of God, there is also nothing in it that would prove his non-existence. Nyní k evoluční teorii přírody dle mé filozofie rovnováhy. Já sám spíše věřím Boha, než v něho nevěřím. Proto se snažím dokázat, že evoluce přírody není nemilosrdná, nýbrž, že je spíše milosrdná. Evoluční teorie dle filozofie rovnováhy neodsuzuje evoluční teorii dle Darwina o přirozeném výběru nejsilnějších živých jedinců a jejich evoluční úspěšnosti jako celek nejbližší pouze doplňuje. The philosophy of balance complements Darwin's evolutionary theory by claiming that the abilities or, more precisely, the evolutionary success of a living individual is largely based on his mercy defined here as the infliction of the least possible amount of pain and death by this individual and his ancestors. In other words, as a difference obtained by subtracting the amount of death and pain of living creatures inflicted by a living individual and his or her ancestors from the sum of the lives saved and the amount of the pain relieved by them in relation to any living creatures, this may include humans as well as animals, insects, plants, fungi, living cells, bacteria, viruses, etc. Simply put, what is decisive from the point of view of mercy defined in this way is not only the amount of evil caused by living individuals and their ancestors, but also the difference between good and evil caused by them. This should be the outcome of the hypothesis of the philosophy of balance about the ability of all microorganisms to distinguish a friend or enemy in other microorganisms. According to the philosophy of balance, living microorganisms, especially living cells, are capable of distinguishing and remembering whether we protect them, especially by feeding them or whether we kill them. Therefore, even these living microorganisms, according to the philosophy of balance, are able to distinguish between basic mental reflections and remember their friend or enemy. It could be said that they possess a soul in the religious sense of the term. An adversarial living microorganism is then treated as an enemy by not only these living organisms, but also by their affiliated or related microorganisms, which devour it. In our macro world, this tends to manifest as quarrel, illness, pain, war, injury, disaster, failure, or death. A friendly living organism, according to the philosophy of balance, is then treated in an amicable manner by these living microorganisms. Or more precisely, it is not devoured by them. On the contrary, they devour such living microorganisms that attempt to devour the amicable one. The friendly behavior of the microorganisms manifests itself in the macro world as the peaceful and long life of me and my offspring or a series of friends and comrades who are willing to fight and sacrifice their lives for us. The mercifulness of food was probably the main cause of the evolutionary leap from a common ancestors of humans and primates to man's predecessors, such as Australopithecus, the southern ape, whose food probably consisted solely of fruit and seeds, and Homo habilis, the handyman, who was a fundamentally a herbivore and a scavenger, possibly also eating insects. The transition to slaughtered or hunted animal food was probably the main reason for the evolutionary slowdown in Homo ergaster, the working man, with whom evolution stopped for a long period of time. The transition to merciless food in the Homo ergaster, the predecessor of today's man, thus probably had immensely adverse consequences for mankind's future in the form of wars, diseases, etc. 
especially in that it caused immeasurable suffering of not only animals. The second example of friendly behavior of microorganisms can be the evolutionary success of Stalin, who ordered the killing of many adult men of his real and imagined enemies. Unlike Hitler, however, he was not killing women and children on a mass scale. Unlike the Hitler who, since 1941, had been involved in killing mainly Jewish and Roma women and children, thus perpetrating the worst possible evil in our world due to causing the greatest possible suffering and death. The third example of the friendly behavior of microorganisms can be Hitler himself and his evolutionary, or more precisely, military successes up until 1941. Due to the fact that some positive steps in the area of animal protection were made in Nazi Germany, animal experimentation was radically limited here. On the 24th of November, 1933, it was the Animal Protection Act, Tierschutzgesetz. Shortly before introducing Tierschutzgesetz, vivisection as such was first banned. Later, it was limited. Animal experimentation was seen as part of the so-called Jewish science. On 3rd July, 1934, a hunting ban act was passed, Reich Jag Gesetz. On 1st of July, 1935, a complex environment protection act, Naturschutzgesetz. On the 13th of November, 1937, an act regulating animal transport by car. And on 8th of September, 1938, a similar law related to handling animals during rail transport. An example of the opposite, adversarial behavior of microorganisms can be Hitler's evolutionary failure after 1941. When organized mass murders of Jews and Roma women and even children took place in Nazi Germany, experiments on animals were replaced with experiments on Jews and Roma, including their children. The same purposes were served using war captives. All these murders undoubtedly outweighed the evolutionary benefit of animal protection in Nazi Germany, and apparently also on the German-occupied territory to some extent. The scientific proof of the ability of microorganisms to recognize and remember a friend or enemy would not mean the refutation of religion, whether Jewish, Christian, or some other. But it would show us why it pays off to be good. By example, inflict the least possible amount of pain and death, and how nature, or God working through it, punishes evil, by example, needless pain and death, and rewards good. In other words, non-infliction and prevention of needless pain and death by a living individual. The idea in favor of God's existence would then be that, that someone must have created nature as a fair system, which automatically punishes the above-mentioned evil while also rewarding the above-mentioned good. The idea in favor of God existence would then be that someone must have created nature as a fair system, which automatically punishes the above-mentioned evil while also rewarding the above-mentioned good. Simultaneously, a scientific proof of the ability of living microorganisms to recognize and remember friends and enemies would, according to the philosophy of balance, establish ethics as the expediency of doing the above-mentioned good and the non-infliction of the above-mentioned evil in the laws and forces of nature that predetermine the reward of a good individual and punishment of a bad one. It would not be necessary to anchor ethics in God, personal beliefs, or faith, but it would be possible to anchor it in the natural law of personal benefit in an individual's life. Na základě své exaktní vědecké hypotézy o milosrdnosti evoluce přírody jsem předložil návrh zákona o porážkové daní. The aim of the bill is to tax and thus limit needless slaughters of animals and, by implication, the suffering of animals caused by the slaughters. The problem is that, on principle, these animals are slaughtered at a very young age, after having experienced fattening solely for the purposes of the slaughter, often under very merciless conditions. The slaughter tax bill supposes the exclusion of this slaughter, tax for health, welfare, and other reasons. 
Details are modified in this bill's proposal, including the rules for using the revenue raised by this tax to support farmers in their transition to different, more merciful methods of agricultural production. Furthermore, the bill supposes that these financial means will be used for public welfare projects so that the money raised from debt is simply used for saving life. There are two great risks involved in the slaughter tax bill from the point of view of the above mentioned evolutionary hypothesis on the friendship and animosity of microorganisms. First, the slaughter tax might be set too high, resulting in the forced reduction of the number of the farm animals kept. Second, the slaughter tax rate might be set too low, failing to provide sufficient encouragement and consideration to the general transition of all living creatures to an increasingly merciful method of nourishment, and therefore life as such, as argued by the present hypothesis on the mercifulness of nature's evolution. One of the solutions of these risks is the fact that animals not killed intentionally by a human, for example, those that died exclusively of old age, will not be subject to taxation within the slaughter tax bill. Such dead animals could, under medical supervision and in compliance with valid animal cruelty laws, be produced by large-scale agricultural production. They would be used as food for carnivorous animals kept by humans, or for those humans who cannot do without meat and have chosen this type of food for ethical reasons. This bill will help balance the interests of carnivores and herbivores without forcing a total transition to vegetarian food on the carnivores. Based on the philosophy of balance, it would be possible for the slaughter tax, should it come into force, to fundamentally change our society for the better. Therefore, it would no longer be necessary to rely on some talented political messiah to save us and guide us through the present crisis of the debt-ridden Western democratic civilization. A similar law was in effect during the first Czechoslovak Republic. Therefore, according to the philosophy of balance, the hopes of rescue from economic crisis should not be pinned on individual politicians, but only on the passing of the bill. The philosophy of balance claims that the main political obstacle in every attempt at improving Western democracies is people's imperfect morality. It is common for various opportunists to attach themselves to a merciful person who wants to assert him or herself in politics, and sooner or later, to completely discredit him or her. The submitted proposal for the slaughter tax bill draws on the previous hypothesis of the mercifulness of evolution. For example, on the fact that there is a supposition based on this bill that these opportunists will change their behavior due to the above mentioned friendship of microorganisms saved by this law before succeeding in the total discreditation of the idea of the slaughter tax. Recently, we have had the chance to realize that Western democracy in its current form represents a cul-de-sac, with many more people voting for politicians who will provide them with an opportunity to abuse high welfare benefits without their having to make an effort to earn them. And many wealthy people, in turn, vote for politicians who cover up their property frauds, whether in the form of corruption, tax evasion, or outright tunneling of state or private finances. Last but not least, social unrest is likely to be on the rise, either instigated by the wealthy or the honest poor affected by cuts in welfare benefits due to their abuse by the above-mentioned frauds. This immoral behavior can only continue as long as the democratic state is able to fund it. This year, the largest world economies, including the G7 group complete with Russia, Brazil, India, and China, have to pay astronomic debts in the amount of $7.6 trillion dollars which is 152 trillion Czech crowns, as stated by the Bloomberg Agency. The countries mainly fund this pillaging of property from the loans from other countries. For example, China, which allegedly has the highest foreign exchange reserves in euros and dollars. Or by squandering the property saved by citizens and local banks. For example, according to the EU law, bank investments from the property saved by citizens and banks can represent the purchase of state bonds of the member states as much as 75% of this property. According to the philosophy of balance, the above-mentioned immoral behavior cannot be blamed on bad laws. 
In the current situation, it is impossible to believe that anything can be changed by allegedly stricter control of the budget of EU countries, or that the growing indebtedness of the Czech Republic can be halted by any democratic political party. The thing is that every law is only a piece of paper that must, above all, be supported by the morality of the people willing to obey it. While there exist relatively strict laws against corruption, tunneling, tax evasion, or welfare abuse in the Czech Republic, the morality of people who would obey them is lacking. The philosophy of balance sees two potential solutions to this immoral behavior. Firstly, it is a dictatorship or totalitarian regime that will divide people into the underprivileged, who will only pay the debts without possessing any rights, and the privileged, who will have the rights without having to pay the debts. Here we have the classic Marxist class conflict. Either the war will be won by the poor, who will enslave the rich, an infamous scenario of attempting to introduce communism. Or, secondly, what seems like a more likely development today, this war will be won by the rich, who will enslave the poor. This is the well-known fascism or non-welfare capitalism. The second solution to the above-mentioned immoral behavior of the inhabitants of Western democratic countries, as seen by the philosophy of balance, is represented by a change in the morality of the inhabitants of the democratic welfare state. That is, to prevent many poor people from abusing unearned welfare benefits and, on the other hand, many rich people from robbing the state. According to the philosophy of balance, this change in morality can be brought about by the proposed slaughter tax bill for one simple reason. If we act mercilessly towards other living creatures, how can we be expected to act mercifully towards each other? According to the philosophy of balance, there are no hermetically separated moralities. Morality among humans and morality in relation to other living creatures. There is only one universal morality which applies to all living beings. If the slaughter tax bill can prevent the above-mentioned immoral behavior of humans, which, as argued by the philosophy of balance, is inevitably heading for a fundamental economic crisis and the fall of Western democracy, it can be expected, though it is not certain, that this proposed means of rescue will sooner or later be tried with the deepening crisis. Na závěr bych chtěl stručně zhrnout svou filozofii rovnováhy. Podle mé dosavadní životní zkušenosti jedinou nejrozumější jistotou, že všichni živí torové ve skutečnosti chtějí žít ve světě, kde se budou mít všichni rádi. A proto je každý povinen působit co možná nejméně smrti a bolesti. Vše ostatní jsou pouhé mé spekulace. To platí o celé mé filozofii rovnováhy. Samozřejmou pravdou je pak podle mne výrok, kdo ze všeho nejvíc chce vlastními silami co nejdříve dosáhnout světa, kde by se všichni měli rádi, tedy dosáhnout ráje pro všechno živé, měl by působit co možná nejméně smrti a bolesti, zejména všech živých tvorů. Rozhodnout podle filozofie rovnováhy, jestli je spravedlivější, aby zemřelo stejně milosrdné zvíře nebo stejně milosrdný člověk, představuje nekonečně složitý problém, který může vyřešit jen příroda, popřípadně Bůh prostřednictvím této přírody. Naši potomci by pak měli pokračovat v našem vychovávání, to jest evoluci všech živých, často nesvajprávných tvorů, jako například zvířat, k stále dokonalejšímu plnění jejich povinnosti působit co možná nejméně smrti a bolesti. Filozofie rovnováhy již není k dispozici v tištěné podobě, ale vše je k dispozici zdarma na internetu jako copyleft, tedy pod stejnou autorskou licencí, jako má například internetová encyklopedie Wikipedie. V rámci jejího v celku rozsáhlejšího obsahu jsem dále spekuloval o výše uvedené naší nejrozumější jistotě, čili nutném předpokladu mé filozofie rovnováhy. Respektive pokusil jsem se ho promítnout z hlediska současného stavu vědy nejrůznějších exaktních přírodovědních a společenských vědních oborů. Tyto spekulace však nejsou nutným předpokladem filozofie rovnováhy. Do plného potvrzení či vyvrácení této nejrozumnější jistoty bude nutné se změnou aktuálního stavu exaktní vědy vždy nutno změnit její vědecké promítnutí 
případně upřesnit tuto zjednodušenou definici lásky. There follows written statements of experts in the field of natural scientists. According to an opponent's reply of the biologist and Catholic priest Marek Vacha, the screenplay is very well worked out and it is obvious that you have, have thought things through. But I do not think it is possible to prove that bacteria are either friendly or unfriendly. I believe, perhaps I'm wrong, that there is no such thing as a friendship or animosity in nature among microorganisms. In other words, I do not think that nature invented morality. Like it or not, even in higher organisms, killing is a principle of the game. According to Dr. Yirshi Kunz of the veterinary clinic in Husto Peche, who also supervises the below-mentioned scientific experiment, the viewpoint of current natural sciences regarding the question whether a body, cell, or related cells, in cooperation with the whole body, especially the brain, is, for instance, able to subconsciously recognize and remember a friend or an enemy, not only at a microscopic distance, but at larger distances as well, within the range of centimeters, meters, or even kilometers, is as follows. Contemporary science and biological knowledge are based on scientifically proved and defined facts on the functioning of organisms. These are that peripheral cells, particularly sensitive receptor cells, emit chemical-based signals to the surrounding cells, especially nerve cells. These then transfer the information to the center, the central nervous system, the brain. The brain will evaluate the information and send a corresponding signal to the periphery. This system of cooperation functions both in higher organisms, such as mammals, and in lower ones, such as cholenterata, always in cooperation with a simple nervous system. Other organisms, plants and fungi, lack these functions and abilities. Subconscious behavior is understood in terms of brain activities. The brain reacts on the basis of experience, instincts as well as conditioned and unconditioned genetically coded reflexes. All this seems to be hidden in our subconscious and controlled from the center, the brain. This cooperation between the center and the periphery is a vital for the whole organism. If peripheral cells die or parts of the organism, for example, ordinary skin wounds or burns caused by a hot object, the center evaluates this information and attempts to avoid the situation in the future. This is how a conditioned reflex arises. Cooperation with the center is always necessary. Peripheral cells or parts can die, but the whole, the organism, continues to live as it is controlled from a higher place. On the contrary, should the center die, for example, as a result of an extensive stroke, the cooperation ceases to function. It could be compared to some chaotic state in the body, which, as a whole, then dies. It ceases to exist. Some body tissues, though, can survive for some time. For example, the deceased person will grow a beard. These reactions to outer impulses, if it is possible to define as friendly or unfriendly, can be stored, coded, and carried as genetic information for other generations. They are the so-called unconditional reflexes. There is a whole range of them, for example, songbirds will fly away at the sight of a silhouette of a bird of prey. A hunting dog will freeze or sets when smelling game nearby. An eye will blink when a hand emerges fast in front of it. Through learning and repeating, these reflexes become an increasingly solid part of the genetic information. Pro prokázání výše uvedených názorů o schopnosti mikroorganismů rozeznat a zapamatovat si přítele a nepřítele, jsem navrhl a pokouším se provést následující přírodovědný pokus. Pěstuji pod dohledem odborníka několik měsíců dvě kultury kvasinek odolných na vysoký obsah cukru. První kultura kvasinek je dlouhodobě živena roztokem vody a cukru z rýžového syrupu. Druhá kultura kvasinek roztokem vody a nerafinovaného surového řepného cukru. Poté těmito kvasinkami infikují bulvu dospělé cukrové řepy. Těmto kvasinkám budu stále i po infikaci dodávat tuto dosavadní potravu 
a budu elektronovým mikroskopem sledovat, zda živé buňky této cukrové řepy rozeznají kvasinky krmené rýžovým sirupem jako přítele a například vznikne mezi nimi symbioza a jako nepřítele kvasinky krmené nerafinovaným řepným cukrem, tedy příbuzným pokusné cukrové řepy a například dojde mezi nimi k boji na život a na smrt. Blíže k tomuto pokusu se vyjadřují ve filozofii rovnováhy. Zároveň bych vás chtěl touto cestou požádat, vzhledem k tomu, že nejsem přírodovědec, ale právník, abyste se pokusili navrhnout a provést vlastní přírodovědné experimenty ohledně schopnosti mikroorganismů rozeznat a zapamatovat si přítele a nepřítele. Pokusům na živých tvorech lze ve stručnosti uvést, že připouštím pokusy na živých tvorech jen jestliže půjde o plnění povinnosti působit co možná nejméně smrti a bolesti. Blížší stanovisko k pokusům na zvířatech naleznete v mé filozofii rovnováhy. Chcete tedy podpořit návrh zákona o porážkové daní alespoň podpisem pod peticí, zde je kontakt na petici a tej zákona. Děkuji za pozornost a doufám, že moje práce a práce dalších lidí na filozofii rovnováhy a tomto filmu přispěje ke změně světa k lepšímu.